chapter 21. Ambitiously, I'm going to try to do two chapters. So we're going to read a lot of Bible. We, we are headed towards the end of uh, this book. Uh, maybe in the next one or two weeks we'll be done and get to the, the book of Kings and gives us the history of the children of Israel, the kings who have been there. David is just about to die. So even as we sail towards the end of it, you will see that, you know, David is trying to, you know, recollect a lot of things together to bring a lot of things to memory and the, the, those things that the Lord has been so gracious to him, the, the things that the Lord has done for him. Um, pretty wonderful. And also, you know, part of this story here is, I don't know, it's dropped in the middle of nowhere here. And it's a pretty sad story of what we're gonna discuss tonight. If you're there, 21. God, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the privilege to read it publicly. We ask that your Holy Spirit will uh, drive our hearts towards knowing you more, towards doing your will. So we pray that you help us, God, as we read it through in Jesus' name, amen. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, it is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house because he killed the Gibeonites. So we pause there for a moment. Um, there have been a lot of things happening in, in the land and, you know, we try to recollect, you know, we, David had just ran away from Jerusalem and now he's back uh, after his son Absalom is dead and, you know, um, trying to rethink of, you know, many possibilities. Is it because of what we have done that we have this calamity with us? And it is a good state or, you know, a, a better place for us to find ourselves and actually go to God to ask questions. Because sometimes you see even in the life of David, there are times when, you know, he had confidence on himself. He did not inquire of the Lord. Whether good things are happening, whether bad. And so whatever happens, you know, he's just going to do his will. Um, not the will of God. You remember when that uh, guy was um, cursing him and, you know, kicking dust. David say, whatever, let, let him alone. Maybe the Lord has sent him to be like a thorn in my flesh. If perhaps the Lord will save me, he will. If I am destroyed, I am destroyed. But let this cause take its part in my life. And we would see a, a turnaround that David would begin to again uh, surrender himself to the will of God. And now there is famine and David inquired of the Lord. What is happening, you know? What, what is the cause of these things? And the Lord graciously responded to him. This was year after year. For three consecutive years, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, it is because of Saul. Now, think about it. 
Saul is long gone. He's died. His family is nearly wiped out. We will have a few that will be mentioned here, and then they're going to be killed again to repay of this evil. And, you know, we, we have discussed principles before in this book as we, we study in God's word. You know, the, the things we do, there are times they will catch up with us. You know, don't, don't do things and you, 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 you bury them in the sand and you're thinking, man, these people will never know about this. It will never come out. So, uh, things will come out. You don't know how, you don't know when, you don't know who will cause them, but at some point, things would come out. The, this was God's response. It is because of souls and his bloodthirsty house because he killed the Gibeonites. Now, this is a long story. We, 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 we discussed this uh, in the book of Judges. And also, there it's recorded in the book of Numbers about these Gibeonites. There's a time in the book of Judges with um, Joshua that they, they were in the time where they've gone for war, they're in battle, and then there's their neighbor, the Gibeonites, who actually tricked them. They came and they wore sackcloth, they appeared to people, to, to be like people who really, you know, are in need. And they made a treaty with the children of Israel that if you do this, this is what we're gonna do. And then the treaty was, if we give you these goods, then do not wipe us out, do not kill us. But we know they had done that wrongly. It was not supposed to be that way, but nonetheless, it was a treaty that was made back then. But you see, after that was made, you know, they became like slaves to the children of Israel. They became their, their laborers, working for them and being with them. And apparently the Lord honors this kind of stuff, that if you say you're gonna do this to people, you're supposed to honor it, regardless of who they are. Honor your vows. Honor your words. You say, well, I had said I will bless these people with this. I'll do this for them, but I don't think they need it right now. <laughs> that is not how it goes. If you had vowed to do something for people, remember it and do it. You know, the preacher man Solomon says, do not be hasty making vows when you enter the house of God. For if you do not fulfill them, they become sin, they become a snare to you. And you know what sin gives birth to? It's death. So these people, Saul killed them. <laughs> and there was a treaty that was made long time ago not to destroy them, and because of, the Bible say, because of his bloodthirsty, he killed these Gibeonites, though they were not destroyed, all of them. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul, had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Therefore, David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? Remember, these are strangers. They're not from the family of the children of Israel. But they had sworn before not to destroy them, and Saul went and did what was abominable. So the king is trying to 
find a solution for these problems. If God brings people under your care, you know, would you be interested to help them? Or you'll be like, you know, whatever, everyone for himself, you know. Because the fact that there was, you know, famine in the land, maybe in the palace, you know, there was always food, right? You know, they'll find a way of finding food, even if they will take it from a far country. They'll have food in the palace. The king will not go hungry. But what about the people? What about the suffering of the people? Because when God sets you as a shepherd over his people, he expects you to lead them to the still waters, to where there's water, where there's green pasture, so that they will be fed. So we see a quality of a shepherd who is mindful of the people who are under his care. And the Gibeonites say to him, we will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So he said, whatever you say, I will do for you. Then they answered the king, as for the man who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from the remnants, or from the remaining in any of the territory of Israel. Let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. Is you guys reading what I just read? <laughs> These people are like, no, we, we, we don't have problem with any other man in Israel. <laughs> we don't have problem with our neighbors. But we weren't who? The person who started this problem is the person who is gonna finish it. You know, some of you will be thinking, man, that is harsh judgment, right? <laughs> no, why would you do that? You know, for, forgive and forget. <laughs> why would you think of killing other people? And it's not just shooting them or something, it's hanging them. A painful death. And it's not before any other shrine, he said. They said before who? Before the Lord. These people are strangers. They are not Israelites, but they have learned the culture of the children of Israel. And perhaps some of them believe in God more than even many of the children of Israel. And say, this is what we are going to do before the Lord. Think about it. That's quite something. Let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I'll give. Think about the, even the willingness for the king to give out these seven people. If this is what is going to bring peace in this nation, is this, if this is what is going to bring atonement 
to the well-being of the children of Israel and also the land, I am willing to do that. <laughs> At whatever cost. There's going to be blood. If you have things in your life that are causing trouble <laughs> within you, in your family, whatever place, are you willing to are you willing to hang those things before the Lord? Are you willing to bring them before the Lord and say, these are the things that are causing me to stumble. Lord, I have brought them before you. Like, Mo, well, I still want to have them for a little bit. You know, David would have said, hey, man, these people were friends of mine. As a matter of fact, I don't know the kind of people I'm going to bring because one of them, I had, you know, I said I'll be be kind to my friend Jonathan. What if the, the, this offspring is from Jonathan? Will I still destroy them? But he say, oh well, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan. You guys remember the story of Mephibosheth, you know. When his father was killed, his father died, and whoever was taking care of him, supposedly historians would tell us, maybe when they were running away or this helper was trying to help him, he broke his knee, he couldn't walk well. For whatever reason, Jonathan had made a vow with David, and David honored that. I'll be kind to you and your people. So Mephibosheth, grandson of Saul, was spared, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So the king took a morning and Mephibosheth, now, this is not the, don't, don't confuse them. We have two Mephibosheth here. <laughs> One of them is Saul's son through a concubine. This is the one that is being mentioned here, the second one, the son of the, so the king took Ammon, Ammoni and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aya whom she bore to Saul. And the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Basilai, the Meholathite. Now, if you guys would go back to history, there's a lot to, to remember. If you do remember, there was... Um, Saul's daughter, who was um, David's wife. And at some point, when David was coming from battle and they're rejoicing and he was dancing to the Lord, giving glory to God for what he had done, this woman said to David, how could you do that? Embarrassing yourself before the people. You remember? What happened to her? Because of what she did, she never gave birth to any child. But how is it possible that we are told that these five other children that are brought are related to her? Do you guys love history? <laughs> They go back and read it a little bit. But we also learn that there is um, Saul's, one of his child who died, one of um, Saul's daughter who died, they tell us in history, who had five children, and this, you know, the, the sister helped raise her children. 
And so technically they belonged to her, but they were her sister's children. That is why they're mentioned as uh, Michal's uh, five children. Says, um, and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for. Oh, uh, it was a uh, his uh, Saul's son. Sorry, he brought up for Adriel, the son of Basilai, the Meholathite, and he delivered them into the hand of the Gibeonites. And they hung them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of the harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of barley harvest. Now Rizpa, the daughter of Aia took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from, from the beginning of the harvest until late rain poured on them, until the late rain poured on them from heaven. And she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. This mother of the two sons who were brought to be hanged, what she did here was very remarkable. A mother crying for her children, covering them. They were fallen there, but what she did, she covered them that the birds of the air or the beast would not destroy their bodies. For months, not just for days, weeks, for months, the beginning of the harvest until when the rain came back again. About four or five months doing that daily. Now David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, the concubine of Saul, had done. Then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the man of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the street of Bethshana, Bethshan, where the Philistine had hung them up after the Philistine had struck down Saul in Gibor. So he brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there, and they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. And they buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin in Zela, in the tomb of Kish, his father. So they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. <laughs> this, was, this is wild. After the death of these seven children, after they had rotten there the bones for months, staying out there, David went and collected again the bones of Saul and Jonathan and brought them together, plus this other one. Then, you know, Kish was Saul's father, so they went and buried these bones there in their father's tomb. Um, and they did all that the king had commanded, and after all these things, the land was healed.
It's like they're being wiped away. Let's continue reading. When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistine, and David grew faint. See, now we've jumped from that story, and then he's telling us here what was happening in these days again. They went into war with the Philistine, and David, I don't know, maybe age is catching up with him, is not the David that we used to know, who used to fight a lot, who used to have a lot of victory, but we are told that he grew faint. Then um, Ishbi Naboth, who was one of the sons of the giants, the weight of the weight of whose bronze spear was three hundred shekels, who was bearing a new sword. thought he could kill David. This, this, these people are not, they, they, they were not wiped out completely. <laughs> the, we'll see, you know, Goliath's brother here again, surfacing. It's like the, they go back and train for some time, you know, how, what really happened to us. We don't want it to happen. We, we ought to train other people. We, we ought to be strong and destroy, now that this man is growing old, maybe we can kill him. And he thought he would actually kill David. But Abishai, this man has been with David. If you guys have read the, you know, the mighty men who are with David, this is one of them. Mighty man of war. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the man of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. <laughs> They're like, man, you're getting old. This, you, you, you can't fight no more. If you go with us, the, the other, the, in other words, they're saying if they kill you, Israel is deemed. There's no light for us. There's, there's nothing for us to, 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 to look forward to. There's no one to guide us. We have known you. You are the anointed one of God. So please, let these sleep you. Go back home. Stay home. <laughs> Stay home. Let this. We'll, we'll, we'll fight it. And you remember, you, you know, Abishai is the one who has always told David, you know, just let me go take care, take care of this business. He's trying to, to mock you. I'll bring his head. This is no big problem. <laughs> and actually, he brought the head of this giant. No problem. You know, he's not scared because of he, he's a bigger guy. He's not scared because he's been fighting for long Time He said, you will not go with us for battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. Now it happened afterwards, there was another war again. They went in battle with the Philistine in, at Gob. Then Sibichai, the Hushethite, killed Saf, who was one of the sons of of the giant. Now this is giant number two being killed when they went for war. Because these were, you know, like the commanders, like um, Goliath was. You know, he's the chief commander of the, 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 the warriors. He goes before the, the, the Philistine, they get victory. But the, this time round, they're going down and down. You know, he killed another one. Again, there was war at Gob with the Philistine, where Elhanan, the son of 
Ja'ari Origim, the Benjamite, killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Yet again, there was war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and had six toes on each foot, 24 in number. And he also was born of the giant. <laughs> now, you, you wonder, this, these details, are they necessary? <laughs> you know, the writer was like, hmm, he has extra. <laughs> he has six. You know, the, this was not just an accident. <laughs> the six. I don't know that they... After he died, they, they, they removed the shoes to just confirm <laughs> what was happening. How did they know? Whatever they wore that time, maybe they saw it or maybe they were just, you know, after they kill these people, they take this uh, war armor out of them as a sign of defeat and victory to the other guys. We give in staggering details about him. He was born of the giants. So when he defiled Israel, you, you, you never do this to the children of Israel. It's like they, they, they forgot what uh, Goliath did. He defied Israel, defied the God of Israel. And you know, uh, sometimes I love listening to people and, you know, historians and commentators of the Bible. Sometimes they'll crack you up. You guys remember when uh, David was coming and he went to the stream and he picked stones. How many stones did he pick? Two? One? <laughs> Five, right? Put them on the sling bag. If it was an exam, some of you would have failed. Like, no, were they Seven? No, there were three. <laughs> you know, some commentator says, you know, these five stones were very prophetic because this guy had four other brothers <laughs> that needed to go down. But maybe not with the hand of David, but through his uh, leadership, these other giants would go down. I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's true, maybe not. But he had five stones. These guys were five mighty warriors of the Philistines. One was down, now four of them are gone. So when he defiled Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimeah, David's brother, killed him. Like, you did not do that. You remember what my brother David did to your brother Goliath? Exactly what I'm going to do to you. <laughs> and they killed this giant. These four were born of the giants in Gath and fell by the hand of who? David and by the hand of his servant. That is the end of chapter 21. <laughs> Pretty bizarre, right? <laughs> They're killing seven people so that the land is restored. And then there's a series of war where each giant is taken down by the mighty warriors of David, all of them down. And then after this, David writes a psalm, writes a song to really be thankful to God to what he's done. David is recollecting all these things that God did when he had enemies, when, you know, people were not being kind to him, people were not being merciful, but the Lord was merciful 
to David and this is the expression of what he's going to talk about here. And this is actually the exact replica of what we would read in Psalm 18. Probably a few words here and there um, changed and they say because, you know, he, he wrote it as a thanksgiving to God and then when they're compiling the Psalms, uh, they say they probably changed a few words so that they would fit a melody of a song. Because when you're writing, you know, songs for, for songwriters and musicians, you can write words, you can write down words, and then when you want to put them musically, you know, you find it just not finding its place. So you change vowels and a few things here and there. But if you'd go to Psalm 18, it's nearly word for word for what is written here in 2 Samuel. And actually there are 50 verses both ways. Apart from this one, you know, the introduction is one verse and then we end in verses 51. But if you'd go to Psalm 18, it is nearly word for word. So we are going to read this song and we'll be done for tonight. This is what the Bible says. And then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies, from the hand of Saul. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, the Lord of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation. You know what they did with the horns uh, in those days? It was a symbol of authority uh, when they would go and anoint people, whether they're priests or prophets, they would take a horn that has oil to go and anoint them, a symbol of power. My stronghold and my refuge, my savior, you save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. When the waters of death surrounded me, the flood of ungodliness made me afraid. David was a strong man, strong in battle, but he tells us that there are times when he was afraid. And it is not sinful to be afraid. When you fear, when, what do you do? You run to the Lord, who is your stronghold. He was afraid. The flood of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrow of Sheol or hell surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry entered his ears. And friends, as, again, as we read, I want to remind you that this was not just an idea. Because when David say, I cried unto the Lord, as strong as he was, as afraid as he could be at times, he cried to the Lord, he said these prayers entered the ears of God. He didn't just sit down and say, this would be a, a beautiful melody I will write that I cried to the Lord and I didn't cry. That would be a lie. David cried unto the Lord. So man, if you should cry, <laughs> cry before the Lord. Take all your troubles before him. And my cry entered his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. And the foundation of heaven quaked and was shaken. Because he was 
angry. Angry at who? Those who were troubling the man David. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens and also, the heavens also, and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows, scattered them, and scattered them, lightning bolts, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of the Lord. At the blast of the breath of his nostrils, he sent from above. He took me and drew me out of many waters. He took me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. In this song, David is admitting that whatever the Lord has done, it is him who actually did it. It is not me. Why? He says that these enemies, they were stronger than me. Maybe recalling a little bit, you know, this giant nearly took David down. <laughs> Abishai helped him. Say, so these people were stronger than me. The victory I have, it is because of the Lord. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord. Now, you know, kept keeping the ways of the Lord is interesting when you hear it from David, a man who has also gone away from the presence of God, saying that I've always kept the ways of the Lord. He's the same man, you remember what Pastor David, uh, Pastor Collins read to us last week when David said, I have been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen a righteous man forsaken, nor his offspring begging for bread. This is why the Lord said, you know, David is a man after my own heart. Why? His confession to the Lord was real. Nothing here is hidden. Lord, you know it. Lord, he said, I'd rather fell in the hands of God, for there is mercy. In the hands of the enemy, they'll kill me. They're stronger than me. And he's saying <laughs> that I have kept the ways of the Lord, which means this thing, they always linger in my mind. Even when I went astray, I knew it. It wasn't right. But when I went to the Lord, he forgave me. And you know that when the Lord forgives you, he's not reminding you of the past mistakes or sins that you did. The Lord separates our sins as far as east and the west. That is done. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. 
wickedly. Like, like, as a man I admit, I have fallen short. But I'm not just planning wickedly that I want to sin against the Lord, I want to do this, I want to do all those things. I want to be faithful to the Lord. You, you regain your consciousness, your God consciousness. You go before the Lord and repent. The Lord forgives. For all his judgments were before me, written before my eyes, all the judgments of the Lord. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness. This is not just, you know, David's righteousness because he was righteous. This is the God's righteousness in David. That is what he's recalling here. According to my cleanness in his eyes. And with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With a pure, you will show yourself pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. <laughs> For those who you know, plan malice, the Lord will be shrewd to them. The Lord would go against them. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. Those who are proud, you're gonna bring them down. For you are my lamp, O oh Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness. For you, for by you I can run against a troop. By my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, his ways is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to those who trust him. All who trust the Lord, the Lord is a shield to them. Just in the beginning of this, uh, the book of um, Psalm, it said the Lord is a shield to those who uh, call upon his name. For who is God except the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? God is my strength and power, and he makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and set me on high places. He teaches my hand to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. This is most important. Say you have given me a shield of salvation. Apart from giving me the strength for war, for battle, uh, my feet like a deer, you have given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. You en enlarged my path under me so my feet did not sleep. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. And I have destroyed them and wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet for you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroy those who hated me. They looked, but there was none to save. Even to the Lord, 
but he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I trod them like the dirt in the street and I spread them out. You have also delivered me from the strivings of my people. You have kept me as the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. The foreigners submit to me as soon as they hear, they obey me. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideous or their hideouts. The Lord leaves. Blessed be the rock. Let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, amongst the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. He is the tower of salvation to his king and shows mercy to his anointed and to David and to his descendants forevermore. That's quite a song, right? And you think about the things that the Lord has done to you how he's been gracious to you, how he's dealt with you. I like the way he ends this. That it's because of his mercy that he's done all this and shows mercy to his anointed one. The Lord is gracious and if you look at what he's done to you, you can only say, that the Lord has been merciful to you. You can only say that the Lord is the rock of your salvation. The Lord is the one who has led and he's the one who has always been with you. And David also, as he ends this song, he also makes a prophecy that this mercy, God will show it to David and to his descendants forevermore. And you guys know for sure that Jesus sprang from David. We call him the root of David, the son of David. He's the rock of our salvation. He's our savior, our king, and our Lord. Let us pray together. God, we thank you for your goodness and we thank you for your mercies we thank you even for this beautiful song that uh, your servant David wrote to us and we, we agree with everything that he's written here. And the Lord lives, blessed be the Lord, the Lord our rock. Let our God be exalted, the rock of our salvation. We know that it is you who avenges us and you deliver us from our enemies and therefore we will lift you above will lift your name above every other name. And the Gentiles will know, the people of this nation will know, the people beyond this town, the people beyond this country will know that you are God, that you alone are our savior. You are our king. You are exalted above. You have shown us mercy. Oh God, we pray that you be merciful to us today, to our children, to our children's children and our generation to come. If you so tarry to come, that they will show forth your greatness to this nation. We thank you, God. Thank you for your word. We thank you that you have been here with us, Holy Spirit. Thank you for speaking to us. And as we depart in fellowship, we ask that you be with us. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church, for coming.
May the Lord bless you and have a wonderful evening.